Hey, good morning guys, I'm the Tech Prepper. Hope you're all doing well. I'm out in a new area today. We're out in Utah and uh, just outside of Zion National Park. And the goal for today is to walk you through how I build my communications plans, specifically my pace plan, my primary, alternate, contingency, and emergency portion of the plan. Now the goal is to establish communication with my training partner, Mike, who's in Henderson, Nevada. We're pretty in close. We're actually about 130 miles point to point, so much closer in than I normally am. So the goal is to assume that primary communication, like my cell phone, is out along with any type of internet-based communication. Um, anyways, my alternate has failed, at least out here uh, at the park, mostly because I can't get into the repeater system in St. George, so we have to fall back to HF. Now, I've had good success at the RV, uh, getting that going with my Hustler RM40, but decided to take the e-bike out here and find a spot along the uh, Virgin River, and the plan is to throw up a 6-watt radio and see if we can do it with all of these rocks in the way. All right, guys, so with 130 miles, we're looking at Envis propagation. Uh, the literature suggests that the rocks on either side should not be a problem since we're looking for high takeoff angles. And in similar fashion to the way I deploy it at the house, I'm deploying my 40-meter uh, dipole fairly low to the ground. This is the TTP MCOM link dipole. And uh, I'm not using much other than a little bit of cordage on each end to tie it off at about 5 feet. And then uh, the analyzer actually looks pretty good. We're at a, a 1.5 to 1 match. So we'll just get into the pack and deploy the 818. Here's the setup here. I just sent out a request for a signal to noise ratio report and a little bit of activity on the waterfall. So let's see who gets back to me. Okay, look at this, guys. We've got um, KI6TRA. That is Carl from Chameleon Antenna. Uh, he's in Arizona, so uh, about... 300 miles from my location. I'm looking for my buddy Mike who does not seem to be there but uh, Kilo Juliet 7 HQF that's my buddy Donnie he's down the street from my house so uh, it looks like I'm actually getting uh, out. oh and there's my buddy Kilo Charlie 8 Oscar Whiskey Lima that's Mike in Henderson. So guys this little setup on the first attempt out here in the Virgin River at uh, let's see what time is it 1457 UTC uh, 857 uh, local time so guys I'm kicking myself for trying to save weight and not bringing my hand mic for the 818 I don't know if you can see this there but uh, two things to keep in mind right there in the center my buddy Mike gave me a plus 7 dB uh, signal to noise ratio which means we could have done voice on 6 watts here and then my report to him was plus 16 and then obviously my message went through really quickly uh, basically put OK in Zion by Virgin River, BTU for back to you, and he acknowledged. So really unfortunate that um, we're not able to uh, do voice. Uh, I had very tight constraints, especially with the bike. I did about 20 miles this morning. Uh, with the e-bike, that's not a big deal. But uh, bottom line is, uh, we could have done voice communication, which would have made this a whole lot faster. And I'm not, again blowing smoke up your ass. This thing is not an ideal deployment. In fact, let me show you how I even have this thing tied off. I tied it off in haste. This is about maybe the five foot mark here. Uh, this is the 20 meter link to the 40 meter link. And it's just going across here and uh, just a little bit of cordage here and just tied off to that tree branch. So, and then we have all of this, uh, I don't know if that sandstone out here rock on both sides of us. I mean, you can see it behind the tree line there. So the military literature is absolutely correct. You can be in a canyon, you can be in a valley, and Envis communication will work. Before we head back, here is a better shot of what we're dealing with in terms of the terrain. Again, very different than the terrain that I typically deal with at the house in Arizona. But uh, yeah, it's always nice to train and see if the techniques you use at home will actually work out in another location. All right, morning guys, we're back at the house and I gotta tell you, I really enjoyed that trip to Zion National Park and look forward to sharing uh, a bit about what we did there. But uh, today's video is primarily going to reflect on 
that exercise, I did specifically looking at how I look at communications planning and how I built a pace plan for that road trip. Now, I will tell you that um, I actually don't have any formal training or experience building communications plans or pace plans, but I do have the last few years of experience where I've been trying my hand at putting them together and have been very successful uh, for the most part. You know, you do run into fails here and there. And then the other thing to keep in mind uh, when you're looking at building a communication plan, specifically a pace plan, is that it will vary depending on who you're talking to, where they're located, what their skills are, and what their capabilities are. So there is no one plan is the big takeaway. In fact, the plan that I put together was very much predicated on where I was traveling, my capabilities, and the other operator I wanted to talk to in my network, Mike, and his capabilities and his skills. So keep that in mind. You may have multiple different pace plans uh, that you have to put together. The other thing we're gonna do with this video today is do a little bit of an after action report and a walkthrough of the day by day activities because there were a lot of curveballs trying to execute on that overall communications plan. So the communications plan I put together is called a PACE plan, and that's your primary, alternate, contingency, and emergency. And the way that works is that you have different modes of communication, and when one fails, you fall back to the next portion of your plan. Now, the way that I like to look at it is I put the primary as the mode of communication that is the easiest and most frictionless to use, that allows you to communicate as much information as easily as possible. All of my pace plans start with basically using uh, or leveraging the cell and internet infrastructure that is available. So in this particular plan, uh, my buddy Mike and I, we primarily use text and then we'll also use email. Again, both of those require that the grid is up whether it's the cell network or internet at large. Now you can include also uh, voice over your telephone, uh, any type of encrypted messaging apps, whatever you want, but basically it's the most frictionless way of communicating that allows you to uh, get the information across easily. Now the alternate communication is the mode that we'll fall back to. Now him and I are fortunate that we're both licensed amateur radio operators. And at the house, we actually have a communication window uh, every morning for about 30 minutes to one hour at uh, I think it's about 1330 to 1430 UTC which is about 630 to 730 AM local time and we're fortunate that where we are in the southwest there is a linked repeater system that actually is linked via RF only there's no internet involved and it basically covers my home state of Arizona uh, Nevada Utah, which is where I travel to, and going into Idaho and Montana. So I incorporated that into the plan. Now the interesting thing, or the interesting thing about uh, the intermountain inner tie system is that um, you have these nodes along your way. So the way that I planned for it was really just to look at their website and take a look at all of the different states that were along my route. And since we were stopping in Flagstaff, Arizona, I found the repeaters that were local to that area. In fact, I'm kind of dog fooding a new design where I'm playing with an A5 uh, binder so that I can actually print out different types of uh, resources that I may be sharing with the Buy Me A Copy folks. But I put together this thing called the TTP repeater trip planner. And yeah, repeaters can fail, but again, this is part of the reason why it's part of my alternate plan. It's maybe cell phone is down and internet is down. This particular infrastructure that I have in our area uh, allows me to degrade to it. So basically I'll put the trip, uh, the frequency, the PL tone, the offset, and then my location. So my first stop was Flagstaff, Arizona. And then I'll put their location of the repeater. In this case, there was one uh, located on Mount Eldon, which provided an incredible uh, radius of operation given its height above ground. And then for the notes there, I put that it was the intermountain inner tie. And then I have a few channels on my different radios that I reserve for travel. I call it TRL V1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So it makes it easy to uh, channelize the operation in advance. Now, that's no substitute for not knowing how to program your repeaters on the fly, but I found it, it's really easy if you're gonna have multiple stops just to do them in that sequence. 
So really quickly, let's go ahead and pop into the RV. This is, uh, I was in Flagstaff, Arizona, and this was the first morning of the exercise where I tried to contact my buddy, Mike. KC8OWL, KT7RUN. Hey Mike, if you're still listening, I'm wondering if you can get back to me for an audio check. Uh, I am recording this and thought I would document part of this trip. So the next day we got back into the RV. We had, I think, about a five-hour drive all the way to uh, Springdale, Utah, right outside of Zion National Park. And the way that I had uh, put this next repeater, again, part of the Intermountain Inner Tie system, was I found the closest big city, which was St. George. Unfortunately, I keyed up and there was no activity. I was a bit out of range, which was expected. So alternate failed there. So the backup plan was to fall to HF, so this takes us to our contingency. And this is where I like to have HF communication because there is no infrastructure whatsoever. It's as long as my equipment is working and my buddy's equipment is working and um, the ionosphere is working or behaving nicely, uh, we're probably going to be able to do what we're going to do. Now the issue that I had was that I was in the RV and we only had a 38 foot space. So not enough room to deploy a wire antenna. Now, I do something called Envis communication with, or Envis propagation with my buddy at home. And this is the technique where uh, usually at seven megahertz or the 40 meter band, we're able to deploy our antennas lower to the ground. And we actually force the RF signal to go up uh, at very high takeoff angles, come back down and shower the region video up here on uh, Envis and how I made that work. Now, you typically don't get that style of communication or propagation with a vertical antenna, but uh, I've done a few videos uh, this year on the Hustler RM-40, and for some reason that vertical mounted both on the Jeep and the RV translates to uh, regional communication, and I am in fact getting Envis propagation. So I was able to uh, deploy that, tune it real quickly, get my little uh, sub notebook, the Panasonic FZM1, and was able to actually do a brief exchange with him over uh, the keyboard using just that little whip antenna right on the RV. Now, the big problem with that antenna is that it's not really conducive to uh, high performance. It's very much a compromised antenna, but again, it's a compromise because of where I was located and my inability to deploy a more performant antenna. So still working with contingency, I decided to take the uh, the e-bike with me. And uh, I've got to tell you guys, the e-bikes are phenomenal. If you ever have the chance to go to uh, the Zion National Park or at this time in 2024, it's uh, May right now, e-bikes are still allowed. And I must have done 20 or 30 miles, at least 20 miles every day, probably 30 on the top end. And it was great not to have to worry about buses, uh, not wait for buses to start. When I did this exercise in the e-bike, I packed up my little Osprey 11 liter pack, put my small Yaesu FT818ND in there, and basically did a ride into uh, the national park. And uh, there I opted to deploy a dipole antenna, wire antenna, it's the TTP MCOM link dipole. Uh, what I love about that style of deployment is that it was very much a field expedient deployment. It was deployed at maybe six feet apex, about five. It's kind of how I deploy my stuff out here in the, uh, in the desert and didn't really use anything other than the low tree branches that were overhead to tie that off. And what was really amazing, well not amazing, I knew this based on the literature, was that I had a rock structure on both sides coming up uh, at least a thousand feet on either end. And that signal, because we're basically doing near vertical, high takeoff angles, was able to come straight up and shower the, the area. And then Mike's antenna on the other end is also deployed as an NVIS uh, deployment where it's very low to the ground and the signal reports were absolutely amazing. Uh, I believe I was receiving a plus seven dB signal to noise ratio report, and I was receiving mic at plus 14. So I'm kicking myself a little bit where I brought that little six watt 818 radio. Uh, the performance was so good that we could have done voice on almost no power. So really successful. 
so anyways, uh, bottom line here is our primary mode of communication was a uh, cell phone. We pretended like it was down. We fell back to the repeater system. It worked for the first couple days of the trip, failed when we went to Zion, and then we degraded to our contingency, which was HF communication, specifically using GSA call as the mode. And I tested two antennas, one when I was at the RV park, and then a more performant one when I had some room to deploy it out in the field. So where does that leave us for emergency? Well, I gotta tell you guys, I'm conflicted because I'm a big fan of no infrastructure, but you have to take a look at other factors in mind. So I brought with me, uh, as I typically do when I bring my pack into the backcountry, the Garmin InReach Mini. And it's a little tiny uh, satellite device that works with the uh, Iridium system. And I basically have that just mounted and carabiner clipped onto my shoulder strap. Now, if you guys have not seen this video, I encourage you to watch this thing. So I was not a believer of that unit until I tried to do amateur radio when I was doing a uh, memorial hike for my uncle in California at uh, Mount Whitney and we had a diabetic uh, emergency with someone in our group who had the Garmin uh, in reach. I did not have it at that time and uh, he went DKA and we were at trail camp which was 10,500 feet and amateur radio even though I had line of sight with my HT into Whitney portal nobody was there to listen but that little tiny uh, satellite device was able to get out and guess what the US Navy came in and saved our bacon so big thanks to those guys again the video is is up here if you want to take a look at it so for me my emergency portion of the plan involves a satellite device what's interesting about that is while all of this was going on we had a solar storm and uh, the first things to most likely get impacted one is HF blackout and also low orbit satellites uh, for whatever reason, I was not terribly impacted. I was able to make all of this work. Uh, we did not try the emergency communication, the satellite, but it's always in my plan, mostly because size, weight, and the ability to be just about anywhere in the world. All right, folks, so I don't want to make this video be any longer, but uh, bottom line is that these communication plans are not terribly difficult. Uh, the key thing to remember is you probably need at least one plan for every party that you want to communicate with, and then think of them in terms of layers that you can always fall back on if one of them fails. Other thing, I could use some help here. I'm not sure what's going on, but uh, I think I'm being shadow banned on Instagram as a platform. I have no idea why my content is offensive um, other than the small expletive here and there. And my, I've been locked out of YouTube for almost two weeks and can't figure out why. Uh, I think it might be related to ads. So hopefully you guys are able to get this video. And again, I have noticed a real drop off. I don't think it's the videos, even though I'm not the best uh, content producer out there. Uh, but YouTube has done something to their algorithm where I was about a, a quarter million views every single month and I've dropped down to like well under a hundred thousand and it's dropping every single day and we're not even going to talk about monetization uh, it's barely even beer money these days so would appreciate if you guys can share this like it comment down below and then if you really want to support the channel i encourage you guys to go check out buy me a coffee all right guys i'm the tech prepper be strong be safe and be prepared